Okay, thank you very much, um, Farhad. First of all, I'd just like to say what a pleasure it is uh, to be here back in uh, Baku, in the land of fire, uh, and cooperating uh, with Sam uh, for this event. Uh, before I make uh, my comments, I just wanted to comment on what Matt actually just said on, the, on this issue of conditionality uh, and the association agreement um, of Armenia linking it to the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh process and the signature of the basic principles. I guess probably many of you know in the room that the exact th same um, proposal was put forward actually by the European Parliament um, last year, um, but unfortunately it was re it's been pretty much rejected, I would say, um, by the EU, uh, particularly coming from member states and the External Action Service, because the thinking in the EU on this topic is actually it's more important to have the agreement initialed and signed um, to press ahead with the democratisation uh, process uh, in Armenia, um, rather than link it to the um, basic principles. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of dis disagreement on that in this room, but that's just to, uh, to demonstrate to you the EU's um, thinking on this issue. Uh, now, coming to my points, um, I'm going to make uh, some comments, obviously, about the EU's role uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, but I'm going to start by just saying uh, a couple of words more broadly about the EU um, and conflict resolution in its neighbourhood. I think it's quite unfortunate that while the EU may have won um, the Nobel Prize uh, for bringing peace to the European continent and has also been very successful in peace building in the Western Balkans when it actually comes to uh, resolving these protracted conflicts uh, in its neighbourhood, the EU does have a particularly poor um, record. As I, we also just heard from Matt, the best example um, is actually Cyprus, where the EU actually made the situa situation worse um, by allowing the divided um, island um, into the EU. And it seems whether we'll ever get a resolution to the Cyprus problem remains you know, very qu questionable. However, within the European neighbourhood policy, conflict resolution um, is supposed to be um, a priority. And the EU has definitely stepped up its efforts um, in this respect. But of course, the efforts um, that, that it has stepped up have dif differentiated uh, in each um, of these conflicts in the region. I mean, clearly we can say that Transnistria has received the maximum amount of tension. The EU has been extremely proactive um, with Transnistria. We've seen a lot of political will by member states. I would also say this has been the exact same approach from the, o the various OSCE chairmanships. Uh, the current um, Ukrainian OSCE chairmanship so far, I mean, we're six months down the line, has certainly showed a far greater interest in resolution of Transnistria than of Nagorno-Karabakh. And I would also say the same could be said for the previous Irish presidency. Um, after Transnistria, the EU is obviously secondly involved in Georgia, but this involvement came as quite you know, a surprise to the EU. Let's say they were sort of thrown in um, at the deep end um, following the war. And last but not least, we come to Nagorno-Karabakh, where the EU has remained uh, very much on the sidelines, a periphery player, uh, which I would say you could define it as a better, or better than nothing approach, even though this conflict actually represents the greatest security threat um, to this region and beyond. Now, just returning back to Transnistria a second, um, let's see why this conflict has received the most amount of attention. First of all, it borders directly on the EU. Secondly, it has uh, the support uh, of some heavyweight countries who want a solution to this conflict. Uh, I'm thinking about Germany here. They've seen resolution as important and put political clout into it. Angela Merkel has had direct talks um, with Moscow um, on the issue, which is something that's never happened um, on a sort of bilateral level uh, between an EU leader uh, and Russia when it's come to Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Nagorno also, the conflict uh, is seen as being the easiest to resolve. Let's say, it, you could say it has the most friendly um, or modest uh, separatist regime. Uh, and also, the, the External Action Service is looking for um, a success story when it comes to conflict resolution. And for them, Transnistria um, has represented this. So the EU is part of the five plus two talks. It's implemented many, many confidence building measures, uh, including establishing rail links, facilitating, facilitating trade, and has, a, has had a very effective border management project called EU-BAM. Um, 
of course, we know there's still no um, resolution to this conflict, but it hasn't stopped the EU continuing to have a proactive approach in coming up with new ideas towards finding a solution. And this is definitely not the, the approach we have towards the Karabakh conflict. I mean, in theory, the EU should be more concerned about Karabakh because it's the greatest threat um, for, the, for the entire region to security, to energy and transport corridors. And you would obviously think that the EU would have learned uh, some lessons from its Georgian experience. But clearly it hasn't, which is why we still have this, I would class it as a complacent approach. Now let's go back in time slightly. In the 2003 uh, European Union security strategy, uh, the EU is called to take a stronger and more active interest in the problems of the South Caucasus. After this, we had the appointment of the first special representative, Mr. Talviti, who I'm sure you will all remember. And part of his mandate, um, he had a broad mandate to be fair, was resolution of conflicts as well as promoting the return of refugees and internally di displaced people. Now, if we look 10 years on, we can see that on the first point, the EU has only taken very, very modest steps. On the second point, um, much less, if anything at all, quite frankly. And in terms of a challenge, a solution of Karabakh, um, I would say, ranks very, very low uh, for the EU. Even though, as we've just heard, the conflict today is you know, very st stagnant, more stagnant than it has been for a very um, long time. But the EU um, always has more pressing issues to deal with and its resources are increasingly squeezed. And secondly, it's the fact that the EU still considers itself to be a supportive actor in the solution of the conflict rather than playing a key role. So consequently, the EU really doesn't have um, any clear strategy uh, for the resolution of this conflict at all. Now, I would say that the EU's approach comes under four points. First of all, as we've already heard, uh, supporting the efforts of the Minsk Group co-chairs, who have pretty much taken ownership of the entire process, and I would say they almost see it as their personal project. Uh, apart from that, the EU has also supported the efforts of other external players, uh, predominantly Russia. It's never shown any interest to get further involved in this respect. Then we have the shuttle diplomacy that's carried out by the EU Special Representative, Monsieur Lefort. The EU claim it was Mr. Lefort's um, shuttle diplomacy that actually prevented uh, the Armenians from launching uh, their, their first flight uh, to Hojali Airport in the occupied uh, territories. Third, we have uh, confidence building measures and peace building projects, most particularly uh, the famous EPNK, the European Partnership for the Peaceful Resolution of the Karabakh Conflict. This uh, partnership, as I guess probably many of you know, works with local partners on peace building efforts, trying to build people to people contacts with youth journalists uh, and in many different areas, but again, so far, the results of these efforts have been quite modest. And of course, the EU has reiterated many times that it's ready to support um, post-conflict resolution. So infrastructure, finance, those sort of things, and even taking part in an eventual peacekeeping mission on the ground. The EU has absolutely no desire uh, to be a co-chair. And as also Matt just said, it would be very difficult to get the French uh, to leave that seat anyway. And quite frankly, I don't believe the EU would be any good um, as a co-chair because it has too many, let's say, legs and tails. They would never be able to come up or decide what sort of policy to have in the first place. There has also been suggested that perhaps the EU could act as a mediator. <coughs> Um, instead of letting the Russians do it, why doesn't Catherine Ashton um, mediate between the presidents of um, Armenia uh, and Azerbaijan? Again, this is not seen as an attractive uh, prospect um, in the EU because they believe it would undermine the current process or even dismantle it. Uh, lastly, I would say, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm being too critical of the EU here, the EU has ignored recommendations um, on what it could do uh, more broadly. I mean, for example, in 2010, you had the European Parliament's uh, strategy for the South Caucasus. Within this document, there was clear steps outlined uh, where the EU could uh, further engage in the Karabakh conflict. We are now are three years down the road. We can see how many of these steps have actually been taken on board. Um, almost zero, unfortunately. Of course, nobody is expecting the EU to solve the conflict. This needs to come from Armenia uh, and Azerbaijan leadership with the strong support from key heavyweight influential 
actors. I mean, this is primarily Russia, as we know, uh, and the United States. The United States needs, needs to have a heavyweight person um, in the Minsk group to balance um, the role of Russia. And I'm, I'm sorry to say at the moment, this is definitely not the case. Unfortunately, being part of an OSCE process um, is not um, that attractive. UN processes are always, always attract, let's say, more well-known figures former presidents or foreign ministers. Again, coming back to Cyprus, Cyprus' problem hasn't been resolved for 30 years, but they still managed to attract um, Ale Alexander Downer, former, Ale former foreign minister of Australia, to take on this. Unfortunately, the OSCE uh, doesn't seem to have um, such an attractiveness. And again, we come back to the dialogue um, between Russia and the EU. We've just heard about that as well. I think this is key. And there is a dialogue that goes on between the Russia and the EU on this issue. Um, this week, we had the Russia-EU summit. Uh, and I un understand from uh, my Russian uh, friends that Karabakh was on, the, uh, was on the agenda. I think it was discussed for about two minutes um, over lunch, um, which really tells you everything you really need to know on that topic. I would say that this minimalistic approach actually quite suits uh, the EU because the EU wants to maintain uh, what it calls its current balanced approach between um, Azerbaijan and Armenia. And this can be done far more easily by taking a back seat rather than a front one. We know that the EU has a very um, consistent policy, or very ambiguous policy, sorry, on the issue of Azerbaijan's uh, territorial integrity vis-a-vis -vis, um, Nagorno-Karabakh. It finds it extremely difficult to be explicit on this topic, um, particularly when it comes to putting it down uh, into writing um, in documents. This is not the case in either Moldova um, or Georgia. This definitely undermines uh, the EU's credibility, but clearly the EU does find, its, find itself very uncomfortable talking about the topic of territorial integrity and also uh, referring to the occupation um, of Azerbaijan's territories, which I think is another reason why the EU is very reluctant um, to have a greater role um, in this conflict. Uh, just um, a last point here on the role of the EU special representative. I think it's extremely worrying now that you have this ongoing discussion in Brussels about the abolishment of uh, Monsieur Lefort's role uh, at the end of this year. We know that his mandate finishes um, at the end of this month. It's going to be extended uh, until December, but it seems that there's, there's a growing consensus now um, in the talks in the EU that it will not be continued beyond, beyond um, the end of the end of this year. Rather, the task uh, is being promoted to be taken up by the uh, offices of the EU in Azerbaijan um, and Armenia. I think for a long time the external action service or representatives in the external action service have resented actually um, the role that Monsieur Lefort has had because they don't like the fact that he reports directly to um, Catherine Ashton. It, it doesn't have to give any information to um, the other people in the external action service, which they feels undermines um, the role and strength the external action service is able to play, play in foreign policy. I mean, personally speaking, um, I would think it would be a, a massive mistake um, to do away with this position. We had exactly the same debate two years ago um, when it came to the end of Peter Semnaby's tenure. And finally, enough lobbying was done to be able to maintain uh, this role. But it seems increasingly likely this time they, they will not be successful and it will be done with. But I think um, doing this is a bad signal, it's a negative signal, and it's definitely a perception of the EU reducing its already minuscule role uh, in this region. I mean, no offence to the ambassadors here and in Armenia, but I just do not think they have the capacities or the capabilities to be able to carry out the sort of shuttle diplomacy uh, and the other tasks that uh, Monsieur Lefort has been doing. Therefore, uh, to conclude, I would actually say the real challenge for the EU is to be able to show itself to be a credible and genuinely interested actor uh, in this conflict and certainly take on a more proactive role rather than being satisfied with the status quo and just having the response, as we've just heard, oh, unless Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, tell us what they want us to do, we're basically not going to do anything at all. This doesn't reflect... Um, the sort of policy you should have from the EU, and it doesn't correspond with the policies that they have towards the conflicts in Transnistria and in Georgia. Thank you very much.